normal, I mean, you've seen these normal distributions, right? That's what would happen if it runs through a community. But when you start doing all of this, which are the interventions, then you can, um, you know, ideally try and change the shape of that. And that's what China has actually done. Um, to my surprise, uh, as, as, as and it was one of those things that, you know, when you spend 20, 30 years in this business, it's like, seriously, you're going to try and change that with those tactics? And, and yes, and, and it was successful. Um, or it is being successful, because look where the cases are driven right now. And one of the things we looked at was, okay, well, if that curve will go like that, you know, big question mark, how many cases have been prevented or, or, or at least delayed as a result of this action? And, you know, rough back of the envelope, you know, we uh, looked at it, it, it's hundreds of thousands of people in China did not get COVID-19 because of this aggressive response. And any time you pull down the force of infection from the epicenter in an outbreak like that, you are going to reduce the probability of it going elsewhere as well. And that was the other big thing we heard again and again from you know, anyone in China was, it's our responsibility to do this for the world, not just for, for, for them. So we, we heard that um, quite a number of times. So the question then became, um, okay, because we, we'd heard before getting there, of course, are the, is this real? And you know, one of the comments I made yesterday was, we know the numbers have bounced around as, as, as they've gone down. And people have asked questions, what's going on today? How come the numbers have gone up, et cetera? And you know, what we as epidemiologists are interested in is not the exact number on an exact day. We're interested in the trend. And you want to know, is that trend real? Is this going down? Is it stable? Or is it going up? Because there were questions about things aren't being shared, et cetera. And so when we dug into that, we, we looked at, you know, multiple different, there's multiple different ways you can try and get a sense of where the trend is going. Um, and one thing you can do is you can talk to doctors who are seeing patients who are running these massive uh, uh, hospitals. And, you know, everywhere you were hearing the same thing um, that, you know, we have open beds. <laughs> and in Wuhan, it was like, we have open beds. We can get people out of, you know, isolation centers and into a proper hospital bed. We're able to, you know, the system is opening up because the number of cases are, are going down. Um, you know, one indication. Um, another one we looked at was uh, they've established what they call fever clinics. And these are places where if you have a fever, you go and they assess you and um, they do a CT scan very quickly uh, They do uh, to see whether or not um, you've got the telltale uh, marks of, of COVID-19 disease, and um, which is an amazing story in some. <laughs> but, uh, and then, and then uh, at these fever hospitals, then a decision is made. They do the test, whether, whether or not you need the test, and then they do the test, and then whether or not you need to be isolated in a facility, et cetera. So uh, the, another thing we looked at, well, how many people are getting tested? Because what's happened is um, as people have, you know, this mobilization of the community has happened, there's been more and more people who want to be tested, quite frankly. And so they've been going and, and getting tested. The numbers have been going up and up and up in terms of people getting tested initially. And at one point, it peaked at about, I think, 46,000 people were being tested uh, almost daily across the country, huge numbers. And then it's down, uh, when we looked at about a week and a half ago, down to 13,000, it was going down like that. And when we went and talked to the people at the fever clinic, you know, they were sitting there not scanning people or not testing people. And they said, you know, this is a change. We had lines and, and, and they aren't there anymore. And that's the second indicator that that is real. It's coming down. And then a third indicator, which was interesting, I, I, I spoke to, um, and again, I mentioned this yesterday, so sorry to be redundant, um, a, uh, a fantastic researcher, a, a man called Chao Bin, who is running a remdesivir trial on severe and, and mild cases in Wuhan. And it's being done in Wuhan, of course, because that's where you have the highest number of cases, you get the fastest enrollment, and we try and get an answer on this um, uh, uh, you know, interesting drug as quickly as possible. And uh, uh, so, so when I was talking to him, I said, so how is enrollment going? And he said, it's a challenge. It's slowing down. It, it has slowed down because there are not enough new patients that we can actually recruit into the trial. So, you know, this all comes back to that question of, is this real? Is what I described to you, you know, this extraordinary mobilization to impl implement 
fundamental public health principles and approach in the absence of a vaccine or a uh, or, or or drugs, you know, in the presence of a respiratory disease, can this bring this down? And it can, and that's the core message, right? We're, we're, we're getting new reports daily of new outbreaks in new areas and uh, people a sense of, oh, we can't do anything. And people are arguing, is it a pandemic or not? Well, sorry. Why don't you go look at, have you got a hundred beds where you can isolate people if you have to? Have you got a wing of a hospital that you're going to close off? Have you got 30 ventilators? Cause you're going to have to help keep the severe cases alive for, you know, they'll recover, but they're going to need to be ventilated for four or five days or, or a week. You know, do you have those people? Do you know who your thousand case, uh, you know, contact tracers are? These, there's really practical things you can do to be ready to be able to uh, respond to this. And, and that's where the focus will need to be. So we looked at this um, and said, okay, the first question I told you about, what was done? The second, what was the impact? Um, and, and, and the impact was, was striking. Oh, I, I showed yesterday another graphic, which might just be useful for people, because in some ways this is, is more striking than the national one. So what you see here, this is the same as when you just saw. These are the data for all of China, right? So going up fast, fast, fast like that, oh, abrupt plateau, and then the skewing as it goes down, rather than up like that, a bell curve, and down out like this. But then if you look at, um, and you can see this is, uh, this is uh, Wuhan right here, which was really driving the main shape of that. Then these are the other areas of uh, Hubei, and this is China outside of Hubei. And remember, there's a lot more people who live outside of the province of Hubei than live in Hubei. But this is a much smaller curve, number one. The other thing, the shape, it's a very flat curve as well. Part of it's a scale, but this is not the shape of a normal epidemic and that happens when you do something to try and change it which is what china has managed to do and what's striking is how far down they've gotten it if, if i remember yesterday someone told me um that i've heard so many figures i think i've heard more figures than there are people in china over the last two weeks but um i think one of the figures i heard yesterday was that uh, zero out of 20, or sorry, 24 provinces had reported zero cases for a day. Um, and, and that's, remember, there were 31 provinces infected only, uh, only uh, three weeks ago. A again, um, evidence, and all of these are as big as any one of the countries that have been, uh, you know, in the news recently with their outbreaks. And, and that's a very hopeful thing, which brings us to the third thing that we were looking at is, okay, where do you go next with China? Where do you go next with the uh, with um, this in terms of of of, uh, of, of the global response? Um, and 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 one thing to mention first is that you know China were not uh, um, acting from scratch. China had had the SARS epidemic or an outbreak rather. Remember in two thousand and three, and they realized they had to set up surveillance for. Uh, atypical ammonias and, and other surveillance systems that they needed to be able to do case finding and contact tracing, you know, at a much larger scale, et cetera. So they had had time and experience to build a system. But um, in terms of where they go next in China, and, and, you know, having seen so much of what they had done, it was a little bit um, uh, humbling to be asked for opinions about, okay, where we go next. And a lot of it was really reinforcing what, what China is already doing. And, and the first piece of it is, you know, the vigilance. Cases are down, but they're not zero. There is still a lot of uh, disease in, in, in the country that, that's got to be dealt with. And remember, the people who get sick, they remain in hospital or in, a, in a, an isolation center for anywhere from two to six weeks. So it's a long period of time. So if you have all of these people that got, you know, um, actually, let's use this one. So if you have all of these people, let, let's go back a few weeks. So if we go back two or three weeks, right? So you're back here. If you have all of these people that were sick at that time, and you got to add some of the ones who were sick, because that's just who were sick on that day or that week, remember? So then you got to add the ones before. So an awful lot of those people are still in hospital or holding center, um, or holding center, pardon me, uh, you know, an isolation center. So. Uh, right now, the, the number, if I remember correctly, yesterday was, was just over 50,000 people um, are still recovering from COVID-19 across, uh, across uh, China. 
But uh, what well, one of the other things we learned, though, is the spectrum of the disease. You know, there's been a lot of question about, okay, what is really the spectrum of disease that this causes? What's the natural history of it? And we got a lot of information there because of just the sheer numbers uh, now. And, and as the epidemic or the outbreak goes forward and they start to get control, there's time to analyze a lot of that information more clearly. So now they can generate, and, and this I take absolutely no credit for, this, this nice piece of work, but this was done by um, the Centers for Disease Control uh, for the report. And what they've done here is try to help people be able to visualize, well, what proportion are mild or common um, when, 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 they're, when they're found? What proportion are severe and what proportion are critical, uh, uh, critically Ill, Ill patients? And I think you have a sense now, like the mild cases may just have a fever and a cough, and, and, and there's, by the time you get to the common, they usually have a pneumonia and they're a bit sicker, but frankly, they're still mobile and, and, and in good shape. Um, the severe are the ones by, the simplest way to say it that is the next step is they usually have um, a respiratory insufficiency of some sort, like their oxygen saturation is going down, or their breathing rate is going up, et cetera. And then the criticals usually have, by then, um, often multi-organ uh, failure. And uh, what we are able to see from this is, okay, what proportion fall into each group? And you can see 80% are mild. And of those, and a really important insight from China is, well, how many of those will go on to severe disease or even death? And you can see from the milds and the commons, very small uh, proportion. This is really mild with pneumonia. With severe or larger, and the worst outcomes, of course, and the critical. But now we're getting to the sheer weight of numbers that help us understand that. And that's really important because you've got a plan. How many beds might you need? How long are you going to need them for? What are the outcomes going to be like? How many are going to become severe and you're going to need possibly ventilation, et cetera? These are really important um, things to be able to plan that. Also, if you want to plan a clinical trial, um, you need to understand, well, would they get worse without the drug or not? Would they go for it? So you need this kind of information is, is so important. And China right now are the only ones who have been able to generate with the kind of numbers to be able to, uh, to help us un under understand that. But what it means is they still have 50,000 cases, as we mentioned. The thing is, any new cases now, they generally know where they've come from. They can link them epidemiologically or link them to a contact, and that's when you know, as you heard from Ebola, <laughs> that that's when you know you're getting control of a, of a situation. You're not getting cases from you know, out of the blue, and you can't link them back, uh, which is, is, is what's sometimes so concerning. Um, so that's the first thing. The second big thing, which is, is a really important message from China, is every governor we talked to, you know, that most of them, they had an epidemic curve that was going down like that. And what were they doing in response? Building hospital beds, buying ventilators, and being prepared. That's what they were doing. They were saying, okay, look, we just repurposed hospitals that are, should be giving general care. If these cases go back up again, and, and that was always what they came back to, we don't know this virus. People are talking about SARS or they're talking about flu. And as soon as we get stuck with those, that two binary you know, approaches and ways of thinking, we're not preparing for the novel coronavirus. We're comparing, preparing for that or preparing for this, but we're not using all the evidence that we have. And, and one of their key points they made again and again was, we don't know what's going to happen next. In China, we've got it right down like this. We think we can manage and there will not be another Wuhan. We know how to manage this disease now in all the parts of the country. Um, if it went to zero and disappeared, that'd be great, but that's not what they're planning for. What they're planning for is this could remain for some time, uh, maybe some time till there's a vaccine, so we will have the capacities to be able to manage it and run society and economy and everything else the way we need to and not lock people down to try and, and, uh, and, and, and manage this. So that's the second big thing they're doing. But it's a good message for the world, right? Um, how many countries are you know, planning hospital beds, planning ventilators, planning you know, O2 uh, uh, supplies and, and, and the lab capacity to be able to manage this? And then the third thing that uh, you know, we, we, we said and asked of China, you know, at this point, the world needs the experience of China. Um, China has dealt with the most disease in the world. 31 provinces have managed this. 
everyone we spoke to, they knew what they were doing, and they've clinically managed huge numbers of cases now. Um, and uh, you know, one of the points you heard me mention yesterday is countries are building barriers between themselves and, ch and China, and new barriers are going up over in the last days at a time when the cases and the risk from China are going down, and you need access to that expertise that much more. Um, you also need China, and it's, it's getting its productivity going. As you've heard, they're, getting, uh, they're doing a phased restart of everything. So they're getting the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, you know, the factories going, um, then eventually they'll, they'll get the schools going, and then they'll, but they're taking a phased approach to try and manage the, uh, the, um, the, the startup now as they go forward. Um, so for China, there were a number of, of, of suggestions about how to move forward, um, and a lot of it was reinforcing some things that were already happening. Um, but then for the rest of the world, uh, and, and that were, those were the bigger things that you heard me speak about um, uh, yesterday, perhaps. But the first thing in the response is there has to be a shift in mindsets. Um, again, around the world, People are thinking, oh gosh, how do we live with this and manage all this disaster, et cetera, instead of, gosh, this virus is going to come. It's going to show up in our country. Um, we're going to find it within the first week. We're going to find every case. We're going to go after every contact. We are going to make sure that we can isolate them and keep these people alive so they survive the case. This is the way we've got to be thinking. It takes a real shift in mindset. And it's not a preparedness mindset, which usually thinks about how you prepare for eventual disasters. This is going to come soon. Um, potentially. You've got to be shifting to a readiness, rapid response thinking. And, you know, in China, one of the interesting things was not only did they designate a whole hospital, and these are big modern facilities, um, with hundreds of beds as, okay, that one's going to manage it. When you go up and think, okay, how do you actually do that in practice? How do you keep it safe? So you go to a ward, you know, if you go to Hoog here or to La Tour, I'm sure most of you have unfortunately had a visit to one of those places. Um, you know, you've got your wards, right, with some doors at the beginning of the ward. Well, what, what China's done, rather than have some beds that are isolation beds, is at the start of that ward, they've built a wall with a window on it. They sealed the whole thing and said the whole ward, all, all that whole 40 beds, 100 beds, is now an isolation unit. I mean, just everything at scale very, very fast. They've taken a stadium, which, which, which I saw. They put 1,000 beds up, 72 hours. You know, the, it's, it's, you've seen these hospitals being built over a week. But they went from, uh, they would convert a training center or a uh, stadium in uh, between 24 and, and 72 hours. That was the time frame they took in Wuhan to increase by 1,000 their capacity. Um, and it was, it was such a disciplined approach uh, to, put, uh, to put that in place. But again, a good lesson. It, it's, okay, we're going to try and not have Wuhans and deal with Wuhans, obviously, but you may have to deal with sporadic cases, definitely. We're seeing that in many places. They get sporadic cases. We're also seeing clusters of cases, and as soon as you start seeing that in places, you have to be ready to manage this at a larger scale, and you have to be ready, you know, in your mind to stop the transmission chains. You have to be thinking that way. Um, and, and, and so there has to be the mindset shift, number one, and there's got to be the readiness planning and capacity building, and it has to be done fast. Um, so yesterday when I said, you know, second big conclusion for the world is it's simply not ready. Um, but it could get ready very fast, but the big shift has got to be in the mindset about what we're gonna, how we're gonna manage the disease. The third big thing, you know, the rest of the world, and, and, and probably this is, is the first one, is you've got to get your population ready and bring your population with you. And your populations, you know, they should be washing their hands now. <laughs> they should be proper, you know, hygiene now. Those things that we should be doing anyway should be at scale in countries because they will make a difference to the spread of a respiratory-borne disease. But you've got to bring your population with you. And your population, you want to bring them with you early because things are going to change rapidly and they've got to have a trust and a way and a machinery to keep people up to date. Yes, we said that. We have new information. Now we do it this way because it's, we have known this virus for seven weeks. So we are going to have to adapt as we get uh, the, um, the, the strategy rolled out. Um, and, and, and the, you know, the fourth thing I would say, if, if, if 
as we look at, okay, the rest of the world would be access the expertise of China. <laughs> and the, you know, they've done this at scale. They know what they're doing. Um, and uh, they're really, really good at it. And they're really keen to help, um, even though they are still working in their own areas. And this was another message that you heard all the time in China. It, it was a fantastic story of um, the human side. It was always about the people and the individuals, uh, everywhere you went, um, from, from, from uh, uh, any, anyone you spoke to. And there was a sense of responsibility and sense of you know, collective action um, and this war footing uh, to, to get things done. But um, the, the, the other thing that was striking was the solidarity between provinces. Because remember, um, every province in, in, in China has been hit by an unknown pathogen that started to do this in the province. And their response was to get on top of it in their own provinces but to send medical teams, PPE, everything into Wuhan. <laughs> you know, when I met with the governors, they said, yeah, we just sent 2,000 people into Wuhan and uh, to, 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 to work. And you wonder, how does that even work, right? So you go to the stadium and say, well, how does that work? And there's, you know, one of the physicians says, well, I'm from, N, uh, from, from Henan or Guangdong or wherever it was. And he says, uh, we run that, you know, that one I told you that was boarded off. We run that one. They just bring a whole team and run the whole thing. And they bring all their own PPE, all their own equipment. They pull it out of that province. And remember, what we're seeing in the rest of the world is, oh, we better build up our stocks and keep it over here. Oh, we better keep this here. We better keep our, you know, whatever. But there's this sense of you get the resources where they're needed. It's in our common interest to get this down. And, and you saw all the provinces operating that way. It, it was really fascinating. So those are the big findings. You know, what China did, the real impact that it had, the implications are you can actually affect the course of this disease. Um, you can uh, change the shape of this, but it takes a very uh, aggressive uh, and, 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 and tough uh, program. It, it, it was a striking thing uh, to see as, you know, in, in 30 years of doing this business, I, I, I've not seen this before, and nor was I... Uh, Sure, it would work. So we, we saw a bunch of other things as well. As I mentioned, there were a number of technical things that we learned about disease severity, um, the natural history of the disease, how it's transmitted, by the way, um, uh, uh, e even uh, some of the work being done on the amyloid origin, very interesting. But then also operationally, how do you run a response like that, right? So talking that through with top leaders, um, how do you set up a stadium in, in, you know, 72 hours and then walk through? You do one, two, three, four. I mean, <laughs> well, that makes sense. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, how you run these kind of containment measures at, the, at this scale. So a, a lot of, of, of really good learnings that will inform uh, other parts of what we're trying to do with this, uh, with this response. Um, I would say... Uh, let me one point, uh, because I know there'll be questions, and, and I'll stay as long as we need to try and, and help uh, with any of those. But um, one of the big questions that we keep hearing about, and, and you will have heard, is about you know how much transmission is going on in communities, right? And you keep hearing the tip of the iceberg, and we can't see this thing, and you know there's millions of people infected and all this kind of stuff. Um, so we tried to look at those kind of questions as well. And we, um, again, you know, you're, you're at war here, and there's a huge fog <laughs> in any war. And you're trying to find those little bits of information that can add up and give you some confidence in what you're saying. So we tried to look at um, what, where was their sampling of people in the population that might give us a sense of how widely this virus was, 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 uh, was spreading. And again, this is where it's great to look at these things in China because the numbers are so big. But um, uh, you've probably heard uh, there's something called an influenza-like illness surveillance system that runs around the world with many sentinel sites that collect like 20 samples every month and get them analyzed, et cetera. But this happens in multiple places of China. And what you could do is look at those data, and they could show you here are our data, our sampling, here's all the flu cases that were coming up. And in November, uh, 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 December of last year, they all went back to look. Nobody, because then when, once we had a uh, you know COVID-19 test, they went back to test all of these. Nobody found it. it. It wasn't there. They found lots of flu. But then in January, they did find it. It comes up in January, the, the first couple of weeks of January. But outside of uh, Hubei, very rare. One might be positive here or one there. It wasn't like all these samples were, were positive, like there was a lot of it circulating. 
Um, and then uh, another thing we did is in, in places that were heavily infected, more and more people were coming to fever clinics. They wanted to get tested, et cetera. And in one place, it might have been Guangdong, I think, they had tested 320,000 uh, uh, samples for uh, uh, COVID, the COVID virus. Um, 320,000, right? It's going to give you some sense of what's going on. Um, and when they started the sampling of those, about 0.4 nine, I think it was, percent of them were positive, so less than, you know, half a percent. And in the recent period, it's something like 0.02 percent. So I know everybody's been out there saying, whoa, all of this thing is spreading everywhere and we just can't see a tip of the iceberg. But the data that we do have don't support that. Uh, what it supports is, sure, there may be a few asymptomatic cases, and that probably is a real issue, but there's not... Um, huge transmission beyond what you can actually see clinically. And that's really important, right? If you're in a war, you would need to be able to see your enemy to, to, to know what you're dealing with. Now, another important development in China, just while we were there, was they've just licensed a couple of zero assays that will let them test antibodies in uh, a whole bunch of uh, people to try and get a sense of if they have antibodies but they weren't sick, you know the virus was circulating. So, you know, maybe I'll be sitting here next week and saying, guess what? <laughs> Those data didn't tell us the story. These ones do. But that zero survey should help us um, understand that. And that'll be important. For example, you want to reopen your schools. You know that kids have not gotten very sick, or very few have. Have a lot of them been infected? Are they part of the driver of this uh, uh, outbreak? It doesn't look like it. It looks like the main driver is not widespread community infection. It looks like it's household-level infection. And that may be part of the reason that China's strategy, find the case, because the close contacts are families, and people usually know them, and you're going to be able to find them and be more successful. Um, and remember, you don't have to find every single one, because you never will. You want to find enough to break the big chains of transmission, slow this thing down, and, and, and get a grip on it. So that's... Um, uh, why we went, uh, what we saw was being done, the impact that we believe it had, and, and how we think it can inform the global response. Um, I want to highlight again, I am not speaking for WHO, because, you know, someone may be going, what? <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's what the evidence says. Uh, and, you know, when you're in a war like this, this is... Um, we, we, we had a big debate with, uh, with some of our Chinese colleagues about, you know, is this a dangerous virus? Is this a serious virus? Is this whatever? The, the bottom line is this virus kills people. You've seen that. And it kills vulnerable people. It kills our elderly. And, you know, what we think of a society is how we care for the vulnerable in our populations, not just, and I hear people say, oh, yeah, but the young survive. All's good. You know, seriously. Um, and, and, it is, uh, and, and that's not always the case either. Young people do die of this disease, as you've seen uh, uh, as well, and they die in industrialized countries. And I think people were also looking sometimes at this and saying, oh, but in China, you know, they don't have this, they don't have that, et cetera. You know, if I had COVID-19, I want to be treated in, in China. You know, we go into these hospitals, and, and, you know, how many ventilators do you have? 50, 60. I mean, just a scale we're not used to thinking on in the West. And then you'd ask, you know, how many ECMO systems do you have? And I was like, seriously, you're going to ask about ECMO? You know, there's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it's uh, to, to when, when the lungs simply, even if you ventilate, aren't going to get enough oxygen. And, and place would say five. And I remember being with Tim from the Robert Koch Institute, like five in one hospital, you know, we don't have that in Europe. And we're using three of them to, uh, and, as, and we were like, well, do they, people come out? And they, yeah. So... When we look at how dangerous this disease is as well, I think we have to be careful looking at the China data because China know how to keep people alive uh, from COVID. They're super committed to it, and they're making a massive investment in it as well. That's not going to be the case everywhere in the world. And as you've seen, we've had tragically lost people in, you know, G7 countries are, 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 are dying of this disease. And... Uh, so it is a serious uh, disease, and I, and I worry sometimes as we look at the China numbers, people are going to get a false sense of security. These people know and they care about keeping these people uh, alive, and, and they do it successfully. They're really good at it. So, folks, that's what we saw, uh, what we heard, what we think can help inform the global response. It's never black and white, but sometimes we'll present our reportings a little bit more black and white in, in hopes that it will drive the discussion about where we go next with the global response. 
So, Margaret, no one looks interested, so <laughs> they look call it a day. They look They're all I, raring to go. <laughs> uh, Bernard, I, I think lots of you guys know Bernard Schwartzlander, the, the chef de cabinet here, and he said, let's try and add up how much many hours you slept in the last 14 days, and uh, I, I don't know, it, it, it barely gets into the double digits. <laughs> so, again, sorry to run on so long, but we saw a lot, and it's a complicated story, so I wanted to make sure you heard it before I hear what would be helpful to clarify. Thank you very much, Dr. Aylwood. I'd like to be treated in China, too. <laughs> but, um, uh, so just to remind everybody, those of you online, if you want to ask a question, dial star 9. And, or if you're using Zoom, uh, put your hand up on the icon uh, on the screen on your right. We'll start with questions from the room. <laughs> well, she's trying to choose who she's going to take from a question from... Um, I also want to thank those of you who tried to contact me. I saw Jamie's hand went up first, because uh, <laughs> people phoned me and called me in, in, in China and the rest. And, and those of you who know me running many crises, I try to be extremely available to the press, because I just think you're so important to managing any crises. Um, it's in my interest. <laughs> and um, in this occasion, we went to a complete you know, blackout, because we really had to focus on this. We were, we were, we were trying to inform a, a global response at a danger of escalating disease. And, you know, people would might, might call and say, well, this happened there or that happened there. You know, it gets you off track. We just had to focus on, on what we were doing. So so thanks for the, the patience for those of you who are frustrated by that. Okay, I'm going to be very geometric. We've got four microphones. One, two, three, four. So I'll take a question over here from the correspondent from CGTN. Hard right. on. <laughs> Terrible. Thank you. Shane from China Central Television, CCTV. I have a question um, that is about, uh, you mentioned China has been successful in containing the virus and, uh, and the disease. It's being, yeah. It's, it's showing success. Let's not put the cart, they're not putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. If they said I said they're contained the disease, they'd have a fit because yeah. that, that they, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being precise and careful. Sorry. So my question is, you suggest that there are many things other countries can learn from China. However, do you think there will be some difficulty for them, for them to accept, to adopt all these measures? That's why are there such difficulties for them? Thank you. Yeah. Um, th I'm going to jump in on the questions. It's a little bit like I said, right? We. Um, this is a respiratory-borne pathogen, and, and when we think about things like flu and the rest, we think, okay, we need a vaccine to manage that because you can't get ahead of the transmission of it. So part of it's a mindset shift that, gosh, this can actually slow this thing down. And frankly, I think the mindset shift is, is the hardest part. It's really hard work too, right? Kind of easy to stick a vaccine in someone's arm. Really hard to find every single case. And you got to find them super fast and uh, get, you know, find every contact, get them isolated. So there's going to be a range of, 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 of challenges. One is going to be that mindset shift. Um, the second is the communities and, and populations coming with it, because to accept quarantine to ex where, where it's needed, to accept, you know, the rapid isolation, et, et cetera, you know, th these are, are, are going to be challenges for, for people as well. Um, and materially, right, have we, are we ready to isolate that number of people, to support that number of people, et cetera? So um, there's a combination of, uh, of, of uh, you know, mindset issues, uh, uh, yeah, I think community engagement issues, uh, and, and, and just material issues. But um, we've got to overcome them. It's as simple as that. So that's just a right now, so it's just a good way, right? Except the, for the public health. It's a good way. It works. <laughs> and for the obvious medicines or vaccines. So, so, so let me say a word about that. Um, you know, with Ebola, we have a vaccine, right? But it's not going to replace case finding, contact tracing. I don't know what the vaccine for this might look like. You know, we have SARS, we have MERS, we don't have vaccines that we've got great candidates, but they're not out there working. They're coronaviruses, right? And remember, there's, so there's six human coronaviruses right now. There's those two, and then there's the four that cause common colds and things like you've heard about. We're not great at coronavirus vaccines. I mean, the whole world of no, people in the world of coronavirus vaccines are going to slaughter me because they're going to say we are great. We're just not using them. But um, we don't have the experience we do with flu and with other, other, other diseases. So, um, you know, and China is very pragmatic. Don't know if we're going to get it. We're going to work on it, but we're going to move this way. Um, that's what you heard again and again.
So sorry, let, let's keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question from... Okay, Stephanie. <laughs> It's been two years. I can't remember which agency. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Yes. Roger. Right. Um, but, um, I wonder if I could draw you, please, on um, infections among healthcare workers. Sure. What yeah. you're seeing in hospitals, you're in yeah. three provinces. Have they? Do they have? An, two parts. Do they have enough equipment? Uh, are they? Are you know? In the training, and then secondly, um, are they? Are you seeing transmission still in healthcare settings? Um, there was a peak in January, but are you seeing given the scale of 3,000? Super important question Stephanie asked about health care workers, right? Because if your health system goes down, you can't run your response. Early days of Ebola in West Africa, it was one of the big, big challenges we had. And it's a common thing when emerging disease, nobody knows, right, hits the health, you know, it enters through the healthcare system. Remember, that's where a virus is going to enter often because they come in looking for care. And, uh, and all of a sudden, boom, it, it blows up. And if I remember correctly, Italy had, a, had, a, had, a, had an issue So uh, w with that. Um, so uh, in, t in terms of, of China, first, on the numbers of healthcare workers, and, and this is a r rough, um, we always have to be uh, careful and differentiate healthcare worker infections from nosocomial inf uh, outbreaks. So a nosocomial outbreak is an outbreak in a healthcare facility, right? And that can be patients infecting healthcare workers, patients infecting other patients. I mean, there can be different ways it works. And when you look at healthcare workers, people often think, oh, that's an outbreak there. Most healthcare workers got infected in the community, not in the healthcare worker. As you get in there and you talk to people who actually did that, and they can tell you, they say, well, no, they know, people often knew where they got infected. Um, and, uh, you know, the ones that are, are, are in the press, and rightfully so, are ones where it all may have happened in a healthcare facility, but the majority hadn't. So there had to be a two pronged approach to this. First was making sure that you run your COVID facilities uh, um, uh, safe. And frankly, that, that was, was, was being addressed relatively uh, early on. But then remember, I told you so that's your COVID hospital, right? And this is your hospital for regular care. Okay, so I'm pregnant, don't feel great. I'll go into the regular care hospital, or I've you know had had chest pain and I'm having problem breathing. I'll go there, and you go into the regular hospital, and you've got, um, in fact, you've got COVID. And so a number of the ones that were happening were actually happening not in the COVID facilities, but they were uh, happening in in in, uh, in the regular facilities. Um, you know, Stephanie. So so the first thing you always have to do in these is try and figure out who's getting infected. How are they getting infected? Where are they getting infected? And then and then try and fix it. Um, and uh, ag again, everywhere we went, this was a, a top priority. And when you went in and looked at okay, how are you managing infection prevention control? You know, all of the basics about clean channels, dirty channels. Um, you know, were in place. Uh, the supplies now largely in place. Yeah, I d we never found anywhere, and there, there there may still be some that where people did say it was really tight, and there were periods where this was a real problem. But uh, again, when you look at the distribution of the healthcare worker infections, most of them were much earlier in the outbreak, and that's the other thing. That's what we're seeing. I mean, you, you've seen in the countries that get reinfected. Boom, you get these. Uh, um, uh, outbreaks because they're not used to dealing with with the d the disease, but um, are they taking it seriously? Absolutely. Are they good at it? Um, absolutely. Are the numbers coming down? Absolutely. In terms of healthcare worker infections, and that's a good news story within it. Um, but it also highlights something that's a little bit different because, again, we think SARS flu, right? But this is is. Uh, doesn't cause, we haven't seen big nosocomial outbreaks like we have with the other diseases, right? So, so something's a bit different. You know, we're not seeing a lot of disease in kids. You know, look at flu. You know, all the kids get sick, right? Um, we're, uh, which is a problem because remember, one of the big problems with flu, all the kids get sick and then all the parents have to stay home and then you lose billions of dollars in, you know, from your economy. That, that's how it works. That doesn't happen with, with this disease. And we never, by the way, when we talk to people, um, we couldn't find an example where a child was the index case in a transmission chain or had, you know, led to the infection of an adult. Now, that might just be people's recall or bias or whatever, but it was an interesting insight because, remember, a lot of things that we test in science, it comes from someone's observation, and, and then you say, okay, is that, why is that? So, um, 
did I cover that well enough, Stephanie? I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling. Because it's such an important issue. Yeah, I mean, oh, one, one other thing, um, Nugget. Uh, so we were in Wuhan, and we, we couldn't go into the fever clinic because you put yourself at risk, and I was going to come talk to you guys, and I wasn't going to put my family at risk, and there's no need to. <laughs> but um, anyway, the, uh, but we could see where they started and went in and got gowned and the rest to go in. And we met uh, this woman there who explained the different stages and the mirrors for how they check uh, the gown properly, et cetera. And she really knew, uh, she, was, she was so impressive. And so I said, so you're like an IPC expert. And she's like, no, God, I do no, something completely different. But I've learned all of this stuff. This is the most important part of what we do. You know, you found this passion everywhere. Um, so, you know, Stephanie, that was important because you wonder, are people getting sent into the line of fire, right, <laughs> with, without the proper equipment? And... Early in this, people were caught in a war without the right equipment. That, that's kind of what sounds like it happened. But then, you know, because if you were coming in from another province, you had to bring all your PPE. So, you know, the, these guys that sent in a team from, you know, Anhui or one of these other provinces, they came with, you know, tons of equipment. They, you had to be self-sufficient. And that was one of the issues with me going in there. And I was told that. I said, look, we have a principle. No one goes in without their own gear. And fortunately, we bought a, brought a bunch of gear, which was all sitting in Beijing, which I told our rep on the phone, guess what? <laughs> that's all going to the ministry tomorrow. But that, that's how it worked. And you found that discipline in everything. Sorry. Okay, we'll take one more from this side. A gentleman there with his hand up. That's Help me out here, please. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's Yang with Xinhua News Agency. Uh, from from which one, sorry? Uh, Yang with Xinhua News Agency. Uh, with, a, uh, with great efforts to, uh, to, the control and the uh, to the control of prevention of the disease, China is also trying to resume the economic activities. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's like a large number of people go back to the places yeah. to, to where they work. So is there any uh, special uh, aspects or any parts that people should pay special attention to when they go back to work? and resume the acti uh, economic activities. And, and again, the, the question Yao was asking is so important, right? So you get this thing under control, then you get massive numbers of people moving again, because remember, they've all been stopped, right? And, and then they carry the virus into these areas. So a couple of things have changed, right? Number one, these areas are prepared. They know how to deal with this disease when it springs up, et cetera. Um, the second is, is that uh, they, they've done a phased reopening of, uh, of, of the, uh, the factories, the, the uh, uh, industries, et cetera. And in phasing that, they've been able to um, manage the risk as, as they've opened more and more uh, of the economy. It depends a little bit on the province because a lot of them have done it a little bit differently. So some went, um, you know, like the week of 8 February, I think it was. Others went the following week. So, so it's been rolled out temporarily a little bit different as well. But the other thing that they've done, and this was interesting in Sichuan when we met with the governor, he said, look, can we show you a video? And he said, look, this is really cool. And I said, sure, I mean, we'll look at everything. And he showed this video that they'd made. And, and again, um, all of the migrant workers, what it did was it was, it was this video you play on your phone, and it, it, it gave you all this information. If you're a migrant worker from Sichuan and you want to go back somewhere, you have got to do X, Y, and Z and go to the, one of these facilities, get screened. You will get a certificate that's valid for three days, and you show up at you know, the next city, and then you will have to show that, and it can be scanned and uploaded, et cetera. But th th there's a whole effort to manage it. Um, you know, at the community population level, but also at the individual level. And, and they had five million people, m migrant workers, that they were going to run through this system. That was one province. So it is a risk, it's a, it's, and they know it's a risk, but the economy's got to work. It, it, it's, it, you know, people have got to work. <laughs> life's, it's not life's got to go on. It's got to power the response as well. Okay, I'm going to go online now and ask Helen Brands while she can have her question. Oh, hey, Helen. Helen, are you there? Hi, Bruce. Um, Hi, Bruce. Um, I have... Uh, sorry, I'm getting a, a reverb. Um, I would ask you right off the top why you're not wearing a mask, if you don't mind, but I, I would also ask you to... Uh, go into um, what you were saying about not finding much undetected mild cases. A bunch of us were hoping that uh, there would be more of the iceberg to be uncovered to drive down the severity of uh, this uh, outbreak, and I think you're suggesting that that's not true. 
Go ahead. No, yeah, we got your point through the echo. Um, yeah. So 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 first, um, don't don't mis, mis, misquote me, please. Um, the this is a serious disease. There's a lot of disease when you get a lot of community transmission going on. You know, tens of thousands of cases in this place. So that's a lot. Um, but what I've heard people say is there's a whole bunch more of transmission. There's not a lot of evidence of that. Now we're going to do serologic surveys. There's a sero assay, and we may find that oh, a lot more people were positive. A lot more people were. Uh, um, affected than we thought. Because remember, with flu, right, it, it's 10, 20, 30, 40 percent of the, the population will have, uh, may have antibodies suggesting that, 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 that they've been exposed um, in, in, a, in a flu season. I'm, I'm not a flu expert, so, so if I've got the numbers wrong, but they're, they're quite high. Um, all of the sources of information that we looked at, Helen, like, for example, we were very, very interested in any kind of sampling that had been done at a population level. And in multiple provinces, we could find, okay, we've sampled, you know, 10,000 people, or we've sampled 50,000 people in, 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 in um, oh, let's say, a, uh, 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 just regular hospital clinics or something like that. So, so this is convenient sampling, right? It's not a study. But in those, they were finding a very low proportion of people actually had the virus. Now, there could be reasons for that, right? Because people are really restricted to their homes. They've, you know, closed restaurants, closed cinemas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, there's all those things, which means, um, you know, and the goal was to break that transmission. So, um, but as, as things resume, that, that's going to be a really important thing to look at. But... Uh, for that to happen, Helen, remember, there would have to be a whole lot of mild cases that you wouldn't find. And in Wuhan, now, you know, these people don't want any more transmission. They want everybody isolated and break the transmission chains. And they're going house to house to check temperatures, et cetera. They're probably not missing, you know, a huge, uh, a huge amount, but not definitely in orders of, of, of magnitude. And then with, you know, asymptomatics, again, it doesn't look like that's a big part of the picture. There, there was just no data that supports that. So, you know, I have to make a judgment, uh, you know, Helen, between what are the data that I have and what are the speculations that I can make in, in, in worst case scenarios. And the data doesn't say the, the bits of data we have. I may be wrong as we generate more data, but, but um, you know, all the data that we have suggests that there isn't this massive, uh, 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 the iceberg is, you know, you've got critical cases, you've got severe cases, you've got mild cases, and a bit of asymptomatic transmission probably at the bottom. That, that seems to be what it looks like. But remember, we've known this disease for seven days, or seven weeks, sorry. <laughs> haven't slept in seven days. It feels like seven Sorry, Helen, does that help? <laughs> we can go into Jason go Gale. Into Jason go Gale. Into Jason but Gale. also, by the way, would you be able to do that to the curve if this thing was going around everywhere like that and you couldn't see it? Hard to believe. And so I have to go with what I can see. Okay, I will go on to Jason Gale. Oh, she asked why I wasn't wearing a mask. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You know, I don't have COVID-19. I'm very low risk. I, you know, I did, I, and, and, you know, I had an hour long grilling um, before I, I did this when I came back. Anyone coming back from travel has to uh, on the WHO side. But um, also, I never had any exposures. You know, we, were, we are careful and we run careful. Um, you know, we have no uh, contact with patients. We have no contact with, con direct, you know, close contacts. We have no contacts with contacts. Um, we washed our hands every three seconds. We wore masks. <laughs> all the time because we had to wear masks. Uh, it's the government policy in the country. We're social distance. We were, you know, I told you, we were uh, on, on trains and cars and everything. One person in a row, everywhere. It was, that's why I'm so hoarse, because you, you have to shout at everybody. Um, when we had meals, our meals were eaten in the hotel rooms. We weren't, all the restaurants were closed, so we weren't even interacting with our group. And then when we, uh, 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 Sometimes uh, there, there would, we, were, we were working and we would, oh, well, like when we went to the CDC, it was between meetings, we went to the CDC cafeteria for lunch. They had a table like this and then another table like this, one person at a table, and there was one setting at each table, and you weren't allowed to sit, you had to shout at each other. And then I told you, the last uh, day we were having, last couple of days, we were working on the report. So 
Margaret would be on that table, you'd be on one table, you on the next table, and we had to use microphones to run the meeting, but everything was distanced two meters apart. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it runs that way there. Um, and you know, any of the hospitals we went to, we go into the clean section. Um, and, and we go nowhere near, you know, there's a dirty section and then there's also a gray zone. We go nowhere near those things. Um, uh, I was trying to give some other examples because I had to go right through all of this. And then um, because I was going out through uh, um, uh, Beijing to do the press conference, and Beijing, as you know, um, uh, you'd ask Yao about people returning to work. Beijing put in place a policy. Anyone coming back from any province is automatically in a two-week quarantine in uh, Beijing, and that applies to us as well, um, unless we're in transit on the, on the, way, on the way out. And so what they said, there was a lot of negotiation about this. When I got off the train from Wuhan into Guangdong, I had a swab yesterday. And they said, you know, we will, we will test you. You've been in the country for two weeks. You're coming through Beijing and a negotiated agreement for how we manage this. And uh, it was negative. But, um, you, you know, uh, it comes back to a science and evidence-based approach uh, to, to what we're doing. If the evidence changes, right, and there were any reason that I was at risk, um, I wouldn't be wearing a mask. I wouldn't be sitting here. I'm not going to put a mask between me and you guys if you think there's any kind of risk. That doesn't make sense. I'm still taking another question from online. Jason Gale, are you there with your you question? With your question? Hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. Uh, hey, Bruce. Lots of feedback. So I will push ahead. Um, you mentioned learning more about the natural history of this disease. 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 How do you how, how do you think it how typically think starts it typically... and manifests? Um, so it it, it I, I, that's a good question. But as one speaks to people, what they remember is the fever, uh, of course. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, in eighty eight percent now now the nice thing you know China has fifty five thousand cases and data on every single one of them at the time of onset. And what they report is eighty eight percent say we had fever. 68% say they had a dry cough. And that's important numbers because, folks, what percent have a runny nose? Throw a guess out there. Because, you know, you always see people going around sniffling and the rest of you worry, oh, do they have COVID-19? 4%. You know, it's not, it's not an upper respiratory tract infection. So, but Jason, sorry, back to your question. Um, so uh, they report that or they report just the couple of days before having what we call prodromal-like syndromes. They feel fatigued. They feel a myalgia. They feel unwell. You know, it's just a general unwellness. So part of this is having a high index of suspicion if you think you've been exposed to someone um, because, because they, 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 they either present with that fever, a dry cough, or that prodromal uh, nonspecific uh, uh, malaise uh, um, you know, aches uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, fatigue. Is that covered, Jason? 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 Uh, uh, actually, I wanted uh, to ask you what, what's causing the pneumonia to progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome and multi-organ failure? What do we know about that? So that, that was interesting because a couple of places had documented uh, the data uh, fairly well. It's not published yet, but what it looks like, um, about 80% of these are, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, mild uh, at time of detection, about 13% uh, severe, and about 6% um, uh, in, in, in critical uh, condition. And then if you look at the percent that progress from one to another, about 15% seem to progress from mild to severe, and then from severe to critical, because I thought it was a higher percent, but it's about 15 to 20% uh, uh, again, Jason. That's what those numbers look like. Um, and then if you look at the survival rates per group, that, that's pretty well published, right? Uh, extremely high in, 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 in the milds, and, and then uh, I'd have to pull the numbers out. But, but the, the, the high mortality, obviously, is in the severes and especially uh, the criticals. And here you have to be careful, right? Because people say, well, what proportion of severe and critical uh, uh, um, survive? And, you know, okay, so say it's 80% in, in, in the Chinese uh, facilities or 90%. Um, that's not what it's going to be in other places. They're really good at managing really complicated disease on big scale right now. Um, so I would not have a false sense of security in the numbers. Okay, one more online. Uh, Tammy, BBC, I have. Hello. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. 
Sorry, I don't know if you can Sorry. hear me. Um, uh, I would like to know what is your response, is your response to, to Miles Woe telling, telling Woe Fanon 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 that millions that of people, that people are infected and that 250,000 are in fact really dead? Uh, we didn't quite get your question. Was that something about 250,000 really bad or 200? Uh, could you kindly repeat that one? That one. That one. What is your response to Miles Guo telling Steve Bannon that millions are infected and 250,000 are actually dead in China? Yeah, I think, uh, I, 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 um, Tammy, I've not seen whatever you just referred to. So again, not dodging a question, but I, I, I simply don't know what I'm re responding to. Um, I, I heard uh, two people, one of them said it, there's a million cases and 250,000 dead and, and being hidden in China or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I didn't go to every single place in every corner of China, but um, I think we have a pretty good sense of, of what the epidemic looks like, and I think these numbers are, are reflective of that. I mean, but I, I don't know where their information comes from. And again, this comes back, you know, I get asked a lot of questions, well, what about this and what about that? I've got to go with the data that we see, and anything that I told you, we tried to use multiple data points to try and observations to try and corroborate it, right? We didn't try and uh, like, oh, we heard that from someone, let's go with it. We, everything, and the team, remember, I told you it was on this team, CDC, NIH, Robert Koch, you know, Japan's top institutes, et cetera, and they all sign off on this thing, so they're, they're pretty rigorous. Okay, questions from the room. Uh, you gotta let Jamie ask a question. He's been okay, all right. You get, you get his hand up. <laughs> Poor Jamie, I'm hiding sorry. behind. Am I not allowed to do that? Thank you. Sorry, no echo on this one. Hopefully, um, th th a couple of things. Um, if I could, um, you mentioned that the science is evolving very fast in China. Um, one of the things that's come out um, recently is that there may be an oral vaccine in, prop, in, in, um, in, in preparation in China. What do you know about that? Um, if you could also tell us about how um, the two treatment trials are going, and particularly the HIV combo drugs with uh, remdesivir. Um, and then just also in the numbers that you've come up with, um, Dr. or D Director General Tedros um, uh, yesterday mentioned to us that, um, that there was a...